Dear student, welcome to our program, Knowledge Quest. The subject is biology, and I'm your teacher, Mrs. Lydia Asiago. We were learning on the characteristics of living organisms, and so far, we tried to discuss on nutrition, and we realized that nutrition is a process where living organisms, they acquire nutrients and then they make use of those nutrients. Today, we want to measure on nutrition in man. Nutrition in man. That is a human being. Now, how do we acquire nutrients? How do we make use of them? For that reason, you realize that the complex food substances that we acquire, we have to break them down into small, soluble and absorbable products. And you realize all that happens in the digestive system. So I want us to go through the digestive system of a human being. Digestive system of a human being. Now, which are these? No, when we talk about a system, a system consists of organs. And I believe an organ is made up of tissues. Tissues that are made up of a, a cell. Now, which are these organs that make up the digestive system? Digestion starts from the mouth. Digestion starts from the mouth. Next part that is involved in the digestion, we have the esophagus. We have the stomach. We have the small intestine, which is divided into two parts. We have the small intestine that is divided into two parts. We have the first part and we have the second part. The first part, we call it the duodenum. The second part, we call it the ileum. Then we have the large intestine, large intestine, that consists of the colon, the rectum, the appendix, and those other parts. Now, remember, we have to understand what is this food that we need to digest. Remember we said we have different classes of food. We have the carbohydrates. We have the carbohydrates. We have the proteins. We have the lipids. Basically, these are the food substances that are complex that we need to break them down into simple substances that can be absorbed into the blood system. So we ask ourselves, where does digestion start? Where does digestion start? Remember, digestion is a process that is controlled by enzymes. Digestion is a process controlled by enzymes. Bearing in mind that enzymes have some properties that we cannot miss to mention out. Number one, you realize that enzymes are protein in nature. So they are affected by change in temperature. Enzymes are sensitive to change in pH. Enzymes are substrate specific and many other properties of enzymes.
And for that, I'm going to pick two properties of enzymes that we cannot miss in this process. Enzymes, enzymes are sensitive to change in pH. Enzymes are sensitive to change in pH. So as we discuss the process of digestion, we must be sensitive to the pH of each enzyme. Enzymes are sensitive to the substrate. The substrate, they are going to break down. So we say substrate specific. Enzymes are substrate specific. They only break down a given substrate. I want to start the whole process. The process of digestion starts in the mouth. So where are we? In the mouth. Now, in the mouth, number one, what do we find in the mouth? Number one, we have the teeth. Two, we have the tongue. Three, we have the glands. So we have glands. And to be specific, which gland? Salivary glands. So I want to be specific. We have salivary glands. These are three things that we have to be keen because each, without each of them, the process of digestion may not start. So what do we do? At first, we introduce food into the mouth. Remember, I'm um, assuming that the food contains the three classes of food. We have the carbohydrates, we have the proteins, and we have the lipids. I want to give an example of a, a meal that is complete with all these three. So that we use that example to explain what happens in the digestion system. I want to use a meal that consists of let me call it fried uh, beans and maize. Now, if I talk about fried beans and maize, a mixture of beans and maize in our layman language, we say that is what? Which food do you think is that? When you have maize and beans, in the layman language, we say gideri, okay? So fried gideri, that is the layman's language. So in this case, the fr when we talk about fried, it consists of lipids. Obvious, you used the fats or the oil. We talk about beans, it consists of the proteins. We talk about the carbohydrates, that is the maize. Or you can take another example. Someone who takes food that is uh, fried beans and rice. Let me say, someone again takes fried beans and rice. Still, it's a complete meal. Why? I have carbohydrates as the rice, proteins, we have the beans, and the fried means we are using some oil to, fly, uh, to, sorry, to fry the food. So that is the lipids. So someone has taken this food. So when you introduce this food into the mouth, that process, we call it ejection. Ejection is a process. Injection is a process that you are introducing food substances into the mouth. Ingestion, a process of introducing food substances into the mouth. I have introduced the food substance into the mouth, but in the mouth, remember I have the teeth, I have the tongue, I have the salivary glands. So what happens? There is a simple process that takes place, a physical or a mechanical process that takes place in the mouth, a process we call mastication. This is just a mechanical process, 
a mechanical process that is taking place in the mouth. What do I mean by mastication? This is the process whereby the teeth breaks down the large food particles into small particles. Why are we crushing? Remember we talked about the premolars and the molars as examples of the teeth. And we say that they contain the cus. I hope you remember that. We say that the molars and the premolars, they have the cusps, which provide a large service area for grinding the food. Why are we grinding the food in the mouth? We want to increase a large service area for the enzyme in the mouth to break down that food or for all the enzymes. Of course, we know that in the digestive system, we have enzymes that are going to break the, down the food. So we want to break down the large food particles into small particles so as to increase the enzyme for, to increase the surface area for enzyme action. I hope you are getting the function of the, the teeth that you have. Without the teeth, you see, you may not achieve the process of digestion. So the teeth are breaking down large food particles into small so as to increase large surface area for enzyme action. And that is why we said that process is known as mastication. It's a mechanical process. It's not a chemical process. Enzymes have not worked on it. That's why we are saying mechanical process. Then we have the tongue. What is the role of the tongue? The tongue is the one that manipulates the food in the mouth. So it turns the food. Why is it turning the food? Remember, we have the salivary glands that secrete a mixture of substances known as saliva. We have salivary glands that secrete a mixture of substances known as saliva. Saliva, in nature, it is alkaline. Why am I mentioning alkaline? Because remember I said enzymes are sensitive to change in pH. So a given enzyme will work best at a given pH. Remember, there are those enzymes that work best in acidic environment. We have other enzymes that work best in alkaline environment. And there are those that work best in a neutral just neutral, not acidic, not basic. But you realize that the enzyme that is produced by the salivary glands, that is in the mixture of saliva. So what consists of saliva? Let's first list what is in the saliva. Number one, saliva consists of water. Number two, saliva consists of mucus. And number three, saliva consists of salivary amylase. Salivary amylase. So this is the enzyme that we have in the mouth. This is the enzyme that is very essential. It is the one that is, will start the process of digestion. This enzyme works best in alkaline environment. And that is why we said, so it works best in alkaline environment. That's why we say that saliva in nature, it is what? Alkaline. Meaning it provides a conducive pH for the enzyme amylase. Now let's find out what happens. What is the role of water? In most cases, we know that water is a, a solvent. In most of the reactions, we know that water is a solvent. So, water can act as a solvent. Water moistens the food. At times, you can introduce dry food into the mouth. But as you chew for some time, what happens? The food becomes waterly. Why? Because there is water in the saliva. We have mucus. Saliva consists of mucus. 
What is the role of mucus? Mucus lubricates the food. Mucus lubricates the food. At the same time, it lubricates the lining of the mouth so that there is easy movement or smooth movement of food in the mouth. Remember we said the work of the tongue is to manipulate the food, turn the food, so that it is able to mix together with the water, mix together with the enzyme, and especially enzyme amylase is the key in this case, whereby enzyme amylase breaks down starch into maltose. Now, you will ask me, teacher, where did you get starch? And our meal was fried beans and rice. Teacher, where did you get starch from? We know that rice is rich in starch. Rice is rich in starch. Starch is an example of a carbohydrate under the class of polysaccharides. And remember we said all polysaccharides must be broken down to monosaccharides. So the first process, the process has just begun. Where has it begun? In the mouth. So the moment you introduce food into the mouth, you stimulate the salivary glands to release saliva. Saliva is a mixture of the three, water, mucus, and salivary amylase. So we expect as the tongue is uh, is uh, mixing, the, the tongue is manipulating the food in the mouth, it is mixing with the enzyme amylase, such that the amylase is able to break down the starch in the rice into maltose. Then what happens at the end of the day? In the mouth, once all that happens, the tongue now is able to roll the food into round mass of round substances that we call the bolus. So the food is turned into bolus such that someone is able to swallow. So once the tongue rolls the food into bolus, it will push that food, that, pol uh, that polus, into the back of the mouth. Then someone is able to swallow. And then that marks the end of digestion in the mouth. I hope you are able to follow. Remember we are discussing on how someone who ate fried beans and rice is able to digest the food. And we said that Complex food substances such as carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids must be broken down to simple and absorbable products that can be used by the body. Now, what happens? In the mouth, it's only starch that has been broken down. So, the digestion of carbohydrates starts in the mouth. So, if you are beans, you ate the fried beans, Nothing has happened. There is no chemical process that has taken place to the proteins and the lipids. It's only mechanical process where we talk about mastication. Now, the next part of the digest digestive system we said is the esophagus, also referred to as the gullet. Now, what happens in the gullet? What happens in the gullet? That is the next part of the digestive system. The gullet is made up of muscles, thick muscles. We have circular and long tudinal muscles. And these muscles, they contract and they relax, contract and they relax to create a wave-like motion that we refer to as peristalsis. So the circular muscles, that is the, the, long, the circular and the longitudinal muscles, they contract and they relax. 
contract and relax. So in the process, they create a motion, a wave like, whereby, assuming this is the gullet, so we have the muscles here. So when some contract, when the circular muscles contract, the longitudinal muscles relax. When the longitudinal muscles contract, the circular muscles relax. So at the end of the day, the food is going to move down the esophagus, that is the gullet, through a process we call peristalsis. So we want to assume this is our food. So this is our food that is in form of bolus. This is another food that is in form of bolus. So the whole process is what we refer to as peristalsis. Now, what gets into the stomach? Because we said after the mouth, we have the gullet, then food moves into the stomach. Now, the stomach has openings that are made up of, there is a, there is a valve that is made up of muscles we call cardiac sphincter muscles. So those muscles, they contract and they relax. So when they contract and they relax, they allow the food to get into the stomach. We are going for a short break. When we come back, we are going to explain what happens when the food gets into the stomach. Stay tuned. Dear student, welcome back. We had gone for a short break. And before we went for the short break, remember we were discussing the process of digestion in a human being. And we used an example of a meal that someone has taken, which was fried beans and rice. Whereby we said that fried means someone used the oil, so there are lipids present. Beans are protein in nature, and then rice consists of the carbohydrates. And previously we discussed and we were able to discuss and say that carbohydrates, their process of digestion begins in the mouth. But the proteins and the lipids, it's only the mechanical breakdown. So we have the food that is getting into the esophagus whereby food moves down through a process we, know, we call peristalsis. Now our food is in the stomach. Something happens when the food gets into the stomach. Remember salivary amylase had broken down the starch into maltose and of course the amylase is still present in the food but you realize that immediately the food gets into the stomach salivary amylase stops working. So amylase will stop working in the stomach. Someone will ask you a question. Teacher, why do you think amylase, salivary amylase cannot work in the stomach? I refer you to what we said, pH. Enzymes are sensitive to change in pH you are going to realize that in the stomach, the pH is acidic. But in the mouth, it was alkaline, meaning amylase works best in alkaline and not in the acidic environment. That is why the moment the food gets into the stomach, the work of amylase stops. Now, what happens in the stomach? Presence of food in the stomach, presence of food in the stomach, stimulates the stomach walls to release a hormone we call gastrin. Presence of food in the stomach 
stimulates the stomach walls to release a hormone known as gastrin. So gastrin is a hormone. And I believe we know functions of hormones, several. For this, I just want to talk about gastrin hormone. What is the work of the gastrin hormone? Gastrin hormone stimulates. Remember, I'm using the word stimulates. The gastric gl uh, glands, gastric glands, to release a digestive juice we call gastric juice. Gastric juice. Remember I said presence of food in the stomach. Remember the food moves, moved all the way to the stomach. So presence of food in the stomach stimulates the stomach walls to release a hormone known as gastrin. Gastrin hormone in turn stimulates the gastric glands to release a digestive juice by the name gastric juice. I've said the gastric hormone stimulates the gastric glands to release a digestive juice by the name gastric juice. Now, the gastric juice consists of various components. Number one, gastric juice consists of hydrochloric acid, hydrochloric acid. Gastric juice consists of an enzyme by the name pepsin. It also consists an enzyme by the name renin. And it also consists of mucus. Now, there is something unique that I want to mention about mucus. You realize that in the digestive system, in the alimentary canal, starting from the mouth all the way, we need mucus. And that is why you find that the lining of the digestive juice has some cells known as goblet cells. These cells are the ones that secrete mucus. And of course, we are going to learn why should we have mucus along the digestive system? It is very important. Now, let's discuss on the components of the gastric juice. Remember our meal, fried beans and rice. Bearing in mind that we digested, we broke down the starch in the rice into maltose. Probably not all the starch was broken down. At times we eat in hurry, so we don't give it enough time for the enzyme to break down all the starch. So probably there is some starch that is present in the food. Now, what is the role of hydrochloric acid? What is the role of hydrochloric acid? Hydrochloric acid. This one we say HCl. What is the role of hydrochloric acid? Number one, it provides acidic medium for the enzyme pepsin and renin. Provides acidic medium for the enzymes. Which are these enzymes? We have pepsin and we have renin. I always remind my students that we said enzymes are sensitive to change in pH. Pepsin and ren uh, renin, they work best in acidic, and that is why we are having hydrochloric acid. Number two, hydrochloric acid kills some of the bacteria, some, I've used the word some, it kills some of the bacteria that can be present in the food. Kills some 
of the bacteria that might be present in the food. And number three, hydrochloric acid activates pepsin and renin. Now, what do I mean by activates? You realize that pepsin digests proteins. Renin digests proteins. And when we talk about pepsin, pepsin is the active part. It is active. So if the cells that are producing the pepsin, if pepsin was to be produced in the active form, then pepsin will digest those cells, any part that is protein in nature. And that is why you realize that pepsin is always produced in an inactive form known as pepsinogen. Pepsino, pepsinogen. Pepsinogen, this one we say it is inactive. So always pepsin is produced in form of inactive. Then it is activated to the active part or active form by hydrochloric acid. So we are saying activates pepsin. pepsinogen to pepsin. Renin also is produced in, f in form of inactive. It also has to be activated. So this one is produced in a form we call pro-renine. So this one is active. So we have this one that is active. This is the active, then this is inactive. Remember we are saying that they are produced in inactive form, such that the moment now they get into the stomach, they are activated into the active form. That is when they are able to break down the proteins. That is the role of hydrochloric acid. We've said Gastric juice consists, number one, hydrochloric acid, which has three functions. It provides acidic medium for the enzyme, pepsin, and renine. It kills any or some of the bacteria that is present in the food, and it activates, activates pepsinogen to pepsin. That is the function of hydrochloric acid. Now, we move next to pepsin. What is the role of pepsin? Remember we ate food that is rich in proteins. Our beans are rich in proteins. So, pepsin, pepsin will break down the proteins, break down the proteins into let me say, breaks down the proteins into peptides. So pepsin breaks down, once it is active, it breaks down pepsin uh, proteins into peptides. So we see the first point where we are breaking down the proteins, it is in the stomach. The first point where we were breaking down the carbohydrates, it is in the mouth. But in the, ma in the stomach, we are not digesting any of the carbohydrates, only the proteins. Then, this enzyme, the ren uh, renin enzyme, it converts the casinogen in milk into casein. such that this one can be broken down by the pepsin into peptides. So basically, what are we saying? We are saying that renin and uh, pepsin, they are, work, they are working on the proteins. They are working on the proteins. 
Now, what about the mucus? The mucus has two roles. Number one, lubricates the lining, lubricates, lubricates the food and even the stomach lining. And number two, it prevents the walls of the stomach from auto digestion. So in a way it is protecting the stomach walls from being digested by the protein digesting enzymes. Now something is taking place. Remember all this is in the stomach. As digestion process is taking place there is churning that is taking churning. There is mixing the muscles, the stomach walls, the muscles, the, the, the circular and the longitudinal muscles, they are contracting and relaxing. They are contracting and relaxing so that to create a, a motion that can cause the churning of food, so that we mix the food with the digestive enzymes. And because there is a lot of uh, uh, churning, Whatever that we'll be having here from the stomach, we no longer call it food, we end up calling it chime. So at the end of digestion in the stomach, what are we producing? We are producing chime. And remember this one is acidic. The chime is acidic. Why is it acidic? Because of hydrochloric acid. We've seen that there are enzymes, and each enzyme is working at a different pH. And enzymes are substrate specific. An enzyme that breaks down starch cannot break down the proteins. An enzyme that breaks down the proteins cannot break down the lipids. That's why we say enzymes are substrate specific. So after the churning process, the food or the acidic chyme now moves to the first part of the small intestine that we call the duodenum. And of course, there are muscles that contract and they relax so as to control the amount of food that is moving from one part of the stomach, uh, one part of the digestive system to the other. So we move to the duodenum. Now, what is getting into the duodenum? We have the acidic chyme. So far, what have we digested? What have we broken down? Some proteins, some proteins were broken down, some proteins were broken down to peptides. Some starch in the mouth, some starch in the mouth was broken down to maltose. And of course, we've not digested the lipids so far. We've not digested all the proteins. We've not digested all the starch. So the process of digestion continues. And because of that, we say presence of food or presence of the acidic chyme in the duodenum stimulates the duodenal walls. We have the duodenal walls to secrete two hormones. First hormone we have is secretin. And the second hormone that we have, we call it cholecystokinine. There are two hormones that are produced by the duodenal walls. The moment the food or the acidic chyme gets into the duodenal, duodenum, the duodenal walls are stimulated to secrete two hormones. So these are hormones. Huh? These are two hormones. And each hormone has its own role. Let's start with the first one. We have secretin. 
Secretin is a hormone. What is the function of this hormone? This hormone stimulates the liver cells to release bile. Of course, we know that bile is a mixture of salts. So we have bile juice, which is a mixture of some salts. Now, secretin also stimulates the pancreas to release some mineral, mineral salts. That is the role of secretin as a hormone that is released by the duodenal walls. Now, why are we releasing the bile? The bile is a mixture, uh, 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 the bile consists of the bile juice, which is a mixture of salts, and this bile is alkaline. The bile is alkaline. So, when you talk about alkaline, what comes in your mind? It means that in the duodenum, we need what? An alkaline environment for those enzymes in the duodenum to function or to do their work. So the first function of the bile, so we have the bile salts. Bile salts, number one, they do neutralization. They neutralize the acidic chime. They neutralize the acidic chime. That is bile. Why? So that the enzymes that, we are, that are going to work in the duodenum, they get an alkaline environment for them to function well. Number two, bile does what we call emulsification. Bile does what we call emulsification. Now, what is emulsification? Emulsification is a process whereby the large fat droplets, the large ones, they are broken down into small molecules. Emulsification is a process whereby this is a fat, so we say this is a fat. Huh? This is a fat molecule. Large molecules of fat, they are broken down into small and tiny fatty molecules. Why are we doing that? We want to increase the surface area for the enzymes to work best. Remember the enzymes that are going to break down the lipids. So far, we've not seen any lipids broken somewhere, but the digestion of the lipids starts. The breakdown of the lipids starts in the duodenum. And that is why we have what we call emulsification. So basically, what am I saying? I'm saying that we have two hormones that are produced in the duodenum. The first one is secretin, which will stimulate the liver cells to produce bile. Bile is alkaline. So in that sense, it is going to neutralize the acidic chain so that we have an alkaline environment for the enzymes to work best. <coughs> Sorry. Then we also have another function of the bile salts as what? Emulsification. So probably from this, we also need to understand what is the role of the, the next hormone. I think this one, we'll discuss it in the next lesson. But so far, we have, uh, uh, we have digested our food substance. Remember, we had a food sample of fried beans and rice. We have discussed, we have seen that beans are protein in nature, rice is uh, carbohydrates, and the process of breaking down carbohydrates starts in the mouth. The process of breaking down the protein starts in the stomach, while the process of breaking down the lipids starts in the duodenum. So in our next lesson, we are going to wind up the whole process of digestion in a human being. We are going to continue in the next lesson so that we wind up the whole process of digestion in a human being. You've been watching 
the program knowledge quest the subject is biology the teacher is mrs lydia asiago see you in the next lesson